Welcome to the College Conservatory of Music. Ohio State law requires that we notify our audiences of all available exits in case of an emergency. Please take time to observe all marked exits now. The consumption of food or drink and the use of cameras or recording devices is prohibited. We also ask that you silence cell phones and other electronic devices at this time. Thank you for your attention. The performance will begin shortly. Hello and welcome. I am Bryce Newcomer and I'll be your host this evening as we take a journey through Give the People What They Want, Profit, Popularity, and Reimagination. From Beethoven's Septet to Grussel's Grand Serenade. Thank you all for joining me and my fabulous colleagues for a unique performance of Beethoven's beloved Septet. As you may notice, there are more than seven chairs on stage. Tonight's performance will feature clarinetist Bernard Purcell's rarely performed arrangement for small military band. Beethoven's septet features a mix of winds and strings. The instrumentation consists of clarinet in B flat, bassoon, horn in E flat, violin, viola, cello, and double bass. Purcell's arrangement, hereby referred to as the Grand Serenade, consists of 11 winds. E flat flute, E flat clarinet, pairs of B flat clarinets, bassoons, and E flat horns, E flat trumpet, bass trombone, and serpent. Arrangements of canonic works often receive a bad reputation, considered inferior inversions, uh, inferior versions of the original. Reviews of Crusell's arrangement are no exception. Accounts of the Grand Serenade disapprove of articulation and embellishment rewrites unusual instrumentation, and added intonation difficulties by doubling octaves. Now that I've gotten you all super excited for this performance, let me spend the next 25 minutes telling you why I disagree with these reviews. I argue Crusell's arrangement follows Beethoven's own method and preferences for arranging, and deserves more attention as Chamberlain's repertoire. First, I consider Beethoven's remarks in letters concerning septet arrangements by Hofmeister, journey, and an unknown copyist for various chamber settings. Second, I analyze Beethoven's own arrangements of his chamber works for melodic, harmonic, and timbre changes. Lastly, I examine instrumentation cons uh, constraints Crusell's military band operated under, and the extraordinary, or as some might say, brave, choice to assign the original solo violin part to the E-flat clarinet, likely performed by Crusell himself. During much of the late 18th century, serenades and divertimentos were public favorites. Kings, counts, merchants, and mayors enjoyed these pieces as background ambiance for their guests at dinner, garden parties, and afternoon teas. Everyone was writing these sort of works, from local amateurs to the likes of Mozart and Haydn. The septet and E-flat composed in 1799 represents the peak of the classical serenade and divertimento tradition. Despite its immense popularity, Beethoven was unhappy that it overshadowed some of his more significant works. Its continued success, evident in its many arrangements for various ensembles, testifies to its popularity among amateur musicians of the time. The septet was first performed publicly alongside Beethoven's first symphony at the Royal Imperial Count Theater on April 2nd, 1800, in a benefit concert for the composer. The piece was dedicated to Empress Marisa Theresa, sister-in-law of Archduke, uh, Archduke Rudolf and the second wife of Franz II, as a strategic move by the young Beethoven to establish himself among Vienna's musical elite. Despite its immense popularity, Beethoven never fully embraced the septet. However, its charm and immediate appeal are its only crimes. Perhaps Beethoven's audience was not as unsophisticated as he thought. Today, the septet in E-flat is widely considered one of the finest septets ever written. Pop, uh, profitability was a major factor in Beethoven's attachment to the septet, considering his documented dismay of the work when he reflected back years later. 
In early letters concerning publication to Hofmeister, Beethoven states, quote, the septet has been very popular for its more frequent use, one could arrange the three wind parts, the bassoon, clarinet, and horn, for another violin, viola, and cello, end quote. Later in 1802, Beethoven mentions arrangement potential once more. Quote, I am offering you a septet, which I have already told you could be arranged for pianoforte also, with a view to its wider distribution and to our greater profit, end quote. Once the septet was officially published and heavily circulated in 1802, these arrangements became realities. Arrangements were either penned by Beethoven, a close contact in which he could give final approval, or by an outsider without Beethoven's explicit approval. I hope you all had grabbed a handout at the front. Everybody has a handout? Great. Having an affinity for profiting on his own compositions, Beethoven participated in the great expansion of music publishing at the turn of the 19th century by allowing and participating in arranging. Example one on the handout details a few of Beethoven's arrangements of his own chamber works. Beethoven arranged the Septet Opus 20 for clarinet, cello, and piano trio in 1805 admittingly as a concession to the public's request for arrangements. Beethoven penned several other chamber arrangements of his works, including a string quartet of the piano sonata, opus 14, number one, a string quintet of his wind octet, opus 103, and a flute and piano version of his trio, opus 25. Fragments of an arrangement for military band were penned between the septet's premiere and its publication between 1799 and 1802. The version utilizes 11 musicians, comparable to the Grussell arrangement, but swaps the serpent for contrabassoon. Previously, this version was attributed to Beethoven due to the time frame and the composer's signature. In Myron Schwagner's historical analysis of this military band arrangement, blatant differences in handwriting and Beethoven's notation peculiarities suggest the arrangement was done by an unknown copyist. Schwagner believes Beethoven's signature suggests his approval of the arrangement rather than his own penmanship. Analysis of Beethoven's letters reveal Beethoven believed each arrangement, quote, must be viewed as a possible vehicle for further exploitation of technical or musical ideas. As a result, Beethoven's arrangements often include substantial rewrites to better fit the ensemble. From correspondence between Beethoven and Hofmeister, it is evident that Beethoven believed preserving the tone color combination of clarinet, bassoon, and horn is ideal in arrangements, while other instrumentation is excusable for the right price. While other arrangements of Beethoven's Septet Opus 20 achieve popularity, most differ from the original substantially against Beethoven's arrangement preferences. Example two gives a timeline of Septet arrangements discussed this evening. Beethoven's student, Carl Cherney, completed a transcription for harmony sextet, two clarinets, two horns, and two bassoons in 1805. Most notably, the arrangement is missing several melodic fragments and the final cadenza, suggesting Cherney based his transcription on an earlier draft of the septet. The original clarinet, horn, and bassoon lines appear in their original form in the second player's parts. The string parts are assigned to the principal players. Consequently, several melodic lines transferred from the violin to first clarinet are altered to accommodate the clarinet's range. Overall, this results in a mellower timbre compared to Beethoven's septet. Despite the blatant rewrites and sourcing his material from an early draft, Cherney preserves the sacred tone color combination of clarinet, horn, and bassoon. Given Beethoven's praise of Cherney's arrangement, we can begin to decipher what Beethoven views as essential and what can be altered to better fit the new ensemble. Franz Hofmeister published an arrangement for string quintet, two violins, two violas, and cello, with Beethoven's permission in 1802. While Beethoven desired arrangements for wider distribution and increased profits, he did not approve of Hofmeister's publication Reportingly, Beethoven did not receive Hofmeister's edition of the quintet until after it was published. 
Concerning Hofmeister's work, Beethoven states, quote, it is unfortunate that it should have been launched into the world with extreme slovenliness and lack of care. It is an extremely unpleasant experience, particularly for the composer, to see an otherwise finely engraved work full of mistakes, end quote. His main objections included Hofmeister's choice to divide the quintet into two volumes and Hofmeister's overlooking of numerous pitch errors at pivotal moments, such as cadences and harmonic shifts. Much like Czerny's arrangement, Hofmeister displaces octaves and changes melodic lines. However, this time counter to Beethoven's arrangement style. To frame the pivotal formal moments, please refer to my first movement analysis, utilizing terminology from Hepikarski and Darcy's Sonata Theory in example three. Moments, such as an increase in energy in transition areas, leading to the medial sejura are of special interest. Example four compares the original septet to Hofmeister's arrangement. In the septet, Beethoven adds voices in their high registers while increasing the dynamic. In Hofmeister's arrangement, the dynamic drop to piano occurs a measure late in measure 48, creating an echo in the first violin rather than a gradual build from measure 47. Hofmeister also interrupts the rhythmic momentum in measure 50, replacing the original bass quarter notes with a whole note in the cello. A couple decades later, after the dust had settled over the initial arrangement controversies, a new arrangement emerged at the hand of Finnish clarinet virtuoso Bernard Henrik Crusell. A student of Franz Tausch and Xavier Lefebvre, Crusell became a distinguished soloist and composer for the instrument. His most popular compositions today include three clarinet concertos, an air and variations for clarinet, a concertante trio for clarinet, horn, and bassoon, and three clarinet quartets for clarinet and strings. His role as a performer and director of Swedish military bands is less well known and often only briefly mentioned in Crusell's biographies. In 1793, Crusell was appointed as a clarinetist with the Royal Court Orchestra in Stockholm. In 1818, he became director of two bands in Linköping, Sweden, where he served until 1834. These bands often performed arrangements of the biggest hits of the time. Crusell's band often performing his own arrangements of popular works by Rossini, Spohr, and Weber. Crusell's grand serenade arrangement of Beethoven's septet was written while Crusell was director in Linköping. Reviews of Crusell's arrangement uh, disapprove of his articulation changes, rewritten virtuosic solo passages, and unusual instrumentation. The instrumentation, differing from traditional harmony music, was a result of the constraints the military's band um, presented. Negative reviews of Crusell's arrangement cite the choice to assign the solo violin part to the E-flat clarinet, a notoriously difficult auxiliary instrument. Contextual sources demonstrate the source of the E-flat clarinet's reputation and consequently its unusual role in the grand serenade. Eric Hobrick clarifies the role of high clarinets. Before high clarinets gained acclaim as a devilish prankster in Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique in 1830, Clarinets in D, E flat, and F were common in bands. Colin Lawson specifies the carryover practice of bands choosing a high clarinet based on the work's key. Beethoven primarily writing for the mellower clarinet and F for his marches. As more keys were added to the clarinet's mechanism, only the high clarinet and E flat remained popular. Crusell himself was performing on an 11 key clarinet produced by Henrik Gressner. A revolutionary instrument at the time, the added keys allowed, allowed a greater ease in chromaticism and playing in different keys. Despite its rascally reputation, the E-flat clarinet is capable of the same virtuosity and sensitivity as larger clarinets. Mark Rogers addresses this issue in the Grand Serenade, calling the E-flat clarinet part a, quote, challenge of musicianship for the finest player, end quote. 
Purcell would often perform on various clarinets while directing the Linkshirping bands. Roger states the likelihood of Purcell leading the ensemble from the E-flat clarinet chair. Illuminating his faith in writing delicate passages in the E-flat clarinet part, rather than utilizing the flute for high violin reassignments. This artistry is still possible today, as we will demonstrate in tonight's performance. Other logistical issues for modern performance of the arrangement include period band instruments now out of fashion, the E-flat flute and the serpent. Tonight's modern adaptation uses C flute instead of E-flat flute and double bass instead of serpent. Rarely seen today, the serpent is a long curved instrument made of wood and is similar in shape to a snake. It is played as a brass instrument by buzzing a cup-shaped mouthpiece. It was especially popular in church music and military bands to play the bass line and provide harmonic function. Since Grussel's septet part is a direct copying of the original septet bass part, reverting to double bass is the natural choice. Transposing the flute part into C places the flutist in their highest register, often doubling other instruments from an octave or two above. This adds additional intonation difficulties non-existent in arrangements without copious doubling of melodic lines. If I could now bring your attention back to the handout, we will dive through examples that compare the original septet with Beethoven's trio arrangement for clarinet, cello, and piano, and Grussell's 11-piece wind band arrangement. These excerpts strengthen my argument that Grussell follows in Beethoven's arrangement legacy treating the writing of the Grand Serenade similarly to Beethoven's writing of the clarinet trio. At first glance, Crusell's choice to utilize the flute as a doubling instrument rather than solo is shocking. Many high violin passages could have enjoyed the mellower timbre of solo flute, Instead, the flute doubles the E-flat or B-flat clarinets parts an octave higher. Of particular interest is Grussell's high and strident doubling in the Adagio Cantabile second movement. Unusual and slow movements, Beethoven utilizes the right hand of the piano similarly in the clarinet trio. Hepikoski and Darcy mark this moment as a rare angst-ridden example of a slow movement exclusion of the secondary and closing zones. Example five compares Beethoven and Grussell's treatment of measures 99 to 102. In the trio, the clarinet line will naturally cut through the timbre. Beethoven's octave doubling in the piano right hand helps balance the two lines of counterpoint. Opposingly, the band arrangement allows the E-flat clarinet to cut through the texture as it reaches for the altissimo register. Consequently, we see Grussell doubling the clarinet in the flute part an octave higher. Analysis of solo violin reassignments reveals several rewritten passages of virtuosic nature, both in the grand serenade and the trio. Consider example six. The fifth movement features the violin at the top of its range with repeated eighth notes at a brisk tempo. Even if Grussell transposed the line down an octave, the flourish is not idiomatic to the clarinet. Instead, Grussell uses an altered flourish similar to the piano of Beethoven's trio. From this example, it appears Grussell may have worked from the trio rather than the septet. However, other examples preserved original writing from the septet, even when Beethoven changed them in the trio. Consider example seven. In the trio finale, Beethoven adjusts the clarinet to come in a quarter note earlier in measure 160 joining the cello on the syncopation. In this instance, Crusell preserves the original septet clarinet part in the first clarinet and includes the trio clarinet part in the second clarinet. While a small difference, 
These conflicting examples suggest Crusell was aware and worked from both the original septet and trio versions. Modern performances of the Grand Serenade can be improved through historically informed modifications. By tracing the instrument translations from the septet to the Grand Serenade, we can utilize a seating chart reminiscent of the septet. Example eight contrasts usual septet seating to my suggested Grand Serenade seating. I suggest the E flat clarinetist and the principal clarinetist sit on opposite sides of the semicircle. The principal clarinet retains the original clarinetist's role in the septet, and the E flat clarinet takes on the violin's role. The flute's role is primarily to provide richness, richness and timbre variation. You will hear the flute most often doubling an octave or two above the E flat clarinet, principal clarinet, principal bassoon, or principal horn with few instances where the flute takes a violin solo for themselves. The septet bassoon line is split between the two bassoons in the Grand Serenade. The bassoons, along with second clarinet, must also weave in and out of viola and cello lines. For this reason, the bassoons should be seated next to the two B-flat clarinets, with the serpent, or in tonight's case, double bass, seated next to the second bassoon. The trumpet line is primarily added by Crusell into the texture. The trumpet emphasizes climatic moments and typically reinforces the horns and bass trombone. For this reason, the brass should be kept together, starting after the flute. Questions of octave changes arise with the modern instrumentation adaptations. Given Crusell's manuscript writing, even he provided two octave options in several crucial moments including the E-flat clarinet cadenza in the last movement. Crusell also indicates obligato octaves in his other clarinet works, likely to account for differences in players' instrument capabilities during a time of rapid key invention. I suggest adjusting the flute part to better fit the transposition to modern flute in C, particularly at moments where the flute is two octaves above its counterpart. Occasionally, the e flat clarinet part jumps down the octave at crucial climatic moments. Crusell's clarinets at the time still required cross fingerings, and pitches above E6 were difficult to execute. Modernly, the e flat clarinetist can complete the intended violin lines in their original octave, climbing up to the high G6. Look out for some of these moments in the variations. Overall, through the evidence presented this evening, I believe Crusell's articulation and recomposition decisions should not be seen as mistakes. Rather, Crusell is more in tune with Beethoven's arrangement style than previously believed. Much like Beethoven's writing of the set pet for clarinet trio, Crusell has adapted the precious work to fit the new ensemble. It is my hope that this work becomes canonic in the chamber winds repertoire and more ensembles will consider the added difficulties as a worthwhile and fruitful challenge. Before I ask the ensemble to take the stage, I would like to personally thank the members of the ensemble for their dedicated and hard work on limited rehearsal time. Anne Lutkenhaus, Kristen Welke, Joey Miller, Andrea Baker, Kathleen Moran, Joseph Rao, Josh Hannon, Dominic Neville, Kyle Milosevic, and Nick Blackburn. I would also like to thank our conductor, Brendan Boyle, for joining me in in-depth study of this arrangement and our many meetings leading up to rehearsals this weekend. To my faculty committee, Pablo Vanitsky, Thomas Gamboa, and Christy Swift, I cannot thank you enough for your guidance and comments throughout this entire process. I hope you all enjoy tonight's performance, and I invite you to join us for reception following the recital in the green room. Thank you.